Good afternoon. I'd like to call the San Jose City Council meeting to order for October 29th, 2013. We're going to start the meeting as we always do with an invocation. Councilmember Rocha will introduce the invocator. Thank you, Mayor. And before I introduce the invocator, um, I'd like to give a brief, brief background on the Billy DeFrank LGBT Community Center from which she is representing today. The center opened its doors on March 1st, 1981 in a two-room storefront on Key Street in South Downtown San Jose. A year earlier, the DeFrank Center's founders had watched with concern as Santa Clara County residents voted to repeal ordinances extending housing and employment protections to lesbians and gay men. The new DeFrank Center emerged from a desire to respond to this setback. As its first visitors entered, they crossed the, th the threshold to a new era of possibility for the gay and lesbian community of the South Bay, and they celebrated an important victory. Since then, the DeFrank Center has continued to inspire purposeful action and ensure a safe place to gather for all in our community. Their current headquarters is on the Alameda where they provide services as far north as Foster City and as far south as Gilroy. Nora Harris currently works in administration and outreach at the DeFrank Center and is currently co-facilitating the Transgender Women's Support Group. She has worn multiple hats at the center since becoming a volunteer in 2004, including having worked as a program coordinator of the center's HIV testing program from 2011 to 2013. I very much appreciate her being here today and please join me in welcoming her. Thank you and hello and thank you once again to Mayor Reed of San Jose and the San Jose City Council for inviting the Billy DeFrank LGBT Community Center of Silicon Valley to this City Council meeting. We really appreciate the invitation to come and talk about our work at the center, especially during the month of October, which is also known as LGBT History Month. Like Mr. Rocha said, the Billy DeFrank Community Center was opened on March 1st, 1981, during a really rough time for LGBTQ people in the San Jose and Santa Clara County areas. At the time, it was possible for people in our community to lose their jobs, access to education, and homes and family due to the discovery of one's sexual orientation and gender identity or the suspicion thereof. When our doors opened, we became part of a nationwide movement towards LGBTQ equality, which is still currently taking place. Much work has been accomplished towards the goal of full LGBTQ equality, but there's still yet more work to be done. Our community um, has taken back our center and has sustained it to the point of not being strictly dependent on funding to keep us open. However, we are still providing resources, referrals, and most importantly, support and a sense of community for people who are still in need of them. For that, we at the Billy DeFrank Center are grateful and continuously motivated to serve our community in the way that we know best, with love, compassion, acceptance, and inclusion. Many of our community members have found the equivalent of family by walking into our center's doors. We're very proud to have a senior nutrition program which serves 46 LGBT-identified senior citizens. This program provides nutritious meals twice a week as well as field trips that reduce the isolation and sense of loneliness that's known to be common in our senior community. We also have a non-clinical rapid HIV testing education and referral program at the DeFrank Center that performs over 500 HIV tests a year in a non-clinical environment. Our HIV test counselors are all volunteer and from our own beautiful LGBTQ community. This program is not funded but supported by Santa Clara County's Public Health Department. We are most proud to have Gay Bingo at the Billy DeFrank Center which happens every Wednesday night. We've had bingo for over 20 years there and it's a way for people to meet others, socialize, but most importantly, have fun and win money. We have a strong volunteer program at the Billy DeFrank Center as well. We have been working with high schools and colleges for our volunteer program, as well as local probation agencies to provide serving community service hours for those who need to accomplish them in order to move on with their lives and become productive members of society. Volunteering provides experience and knowledge that benefits the community at large, and for that we are exceptionally proud. I've been volunteering there at the center since 2004, so I'm coming up on 10 years of involvement. It really does help people make a difference. If you'd like to know more about us or are interested in volunteering with us, would like to donate, or are looking for to see what we're about, please check out our website at www.defrank.org. You can also help us by becoming a member of the Billy DeFrank Center. There's lots of information on our website as well as our volunteer application and board member application. Once again, thank you to all for listening to us here at the Billy DeFrank Center at, of Silicon Valley. We hope to see some of you at our center and out in the community at large. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Next, we have the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the 
First item of business or the orders of the day. I have one change from the printed agenda. We will do the adjournment in memory of Odette Murrow at a later date. Any other changes to the printed agenda? Motion to approve the orders of the day. On that motion, all in favor? Opposed? And opposed. That's approved. Closed session report, city attorney. <coughs> there is no report. We'll take up the ceremonial items. I'd like to start by inviting Councilmember Chu to join me at the podium as we proclaim the month of October Filipino American History Month. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. All right. <laughs> so the third time is a charm. I'd like to thank my colleague and the Mayor for uh, joining me to proclaim October 2013 as Filipino American History Month. As part of the Filipino Amer American History Month, I had the opportunity to, opportunity to attend the Filipino Memorial Project event, which highlighted and, commo and commemorated the Filipino American farm workers' history. Today's action by the council signify our appreciation and understanding of various cultures and events such as the Filipino American History Month, which honors more than half a million members of the Filipino community in the United States. Filipino American History Month uh, began in 1992 in recognition of the diversity, contribution, and cultural that the Filipino American brought to the United States from the Philippines when they arrived in October 18, 1587. In 2009, the California State Legislature designated October as Filipino American History Month. October 2013 makes the fifth anniversary. Earlier this month, on October 2nd, California Governor Jerry Brown signed Assembly Bill 123 into law, which required the state curriculum to include the important contribution of Filipino Americans to the farm labor movement in California. The city of San Jose recognized the contribution made by all Filipinos Americans of our community and they continue to reflect on the importance of their history. Here today to accept the proclamation is Ron Riviera. You all right? <laughs> oh, no, I'm, I'm just <laughs> make sure that I got the name cor uh, correct. And the uh, National Trustee of the Filipino American National Historical Society, or better uh, known as FONS. And also with us is uh, Gina uh, Mariera, and also with Fons and uh, uh, Clarence Madrilijos of the National Federation of Filipino American Association. At this time, I'd like to ask the oh, mayor already presented the combination, so thank you very much. <laughs> No, you, you, you did get our name right, uh, Council Member Chu. Um, on behalf of the Filipino American National Historical Society, Santa Clara Valley Chapter, as well as the National Board of Trustees, which I serve on, uh, thank you to Mayor Reed, Council Members Chu, Kyle Ryan Campos, and the other esteemed Council Members for recognizing October's Filipino American History Month here in San Jose. I just want to say that San Jose was the first and only city in California 
to make this recognition seven years ago. So uh, San Jose, thank you so much for your continued efforts in recognition of this very important milestone. This year, our national organization designated 2013 as the hands that built America, Filipino Americans in the labor movement, to honor and commemorate the 100th birthday of Larry Itliong, who was the organizer who convinced Cesar Chavez and the predominantly Mexican National Farm Workers Association to join the AFL-CIO's Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee, mostly made up of Filipino Americans, to join in the 1965 Delano Grape Strike, demanding better pay and benefits for all farm workers. Because of the strike, Filipinos and Mexicanos together formed the United Farm Workers. California students will soon learn of this valuable contribution that Filipino American farm worker leaders have made through, as Councilmember Chu had said, the passage of Assembly Bill 123 signed by Governor Brown earlier this month. So we are very excited that students throughout California are going to learn about the importance of Larry Itliong, Philip Veracruz, and other Filipino American farm worker labor uh, organizers. Let me close by uh, throwing this to those gathered. In terms of Filipino American History Month, did you know that one of the innovators of Silicon Valley is a Filipino American? After completing his master's in science and electrical engineering and computer science from Stanford in 1972, Diosdado Bonatau worked at several tech companies, including National Semiconductor and Commodore International. He would go on to design the first single chip, 16-bit microprocessor-based calculator. Additionally, he invented the first 10 megabyte bit Ethernet CMOS with silicon coupler data link control and transceiver chip while working at Seek Technology. He is also credited for creating the first Windows graphics accelerator chip for personal computers. So it is because of this Filipino American innovator, Diosdado Bonatau, that we have many of our technological advancements today. Thank you once again, Mayor Reed and esteemed San Jose City Council members for honoring the Filipino American community and our contributions through this proclamation proclaiming Filipino American History Month in the city of San Jose. Thank you so much. And I'd like to invite Councilmember Oliverio to join me at the podium as we proclaim the month of November as Pancreatic Cancer Awareness Month. Councilmember Oliverio will have the details. Thank you, Mayor Reed. I'm joined by Councilmember Pete Constant as we declare November the uh, Pancreatic Cancer Awareness Month. And uh, uh, Councilmember Constant unfortunately lost a, counts, uh, a family member to pancreatic cancer in just a short time from diagnosis uh, to six weeks. But I'd like to turn it over to Sharon to tell us more about pancreatic cancer and about uh, Pancreatic Cancer Awareness Month. Sharon. Thank you, uh, Councilman Oliverio. Um, thank you uh, to Mayor Reed and the City Council for inviting us here today. And uh, on behalf of the Silicon Valley affiliate of the Pancreatic Action, Cat uh, Action Network, we would like to thank you all also for this opportunity. Uh, the Action Network is one of the only national organizations created hope in comprehensive ways through research, patient support, community outreach, and advocacy for a cure. I am here today because I am a pancreatic cancer survivor for seven years. Like many people, I knew almost nothing about pancreatic cancer. As a survivor, I want to raise awareness. It isn't only my life and the lives of my family members who have been touched by this disease. This is a problem that is affecting our entire community. The incidence and death rate for pancreatic cancers are increasing. And pancreatic cancer is anticipated to move from the fourth to the second leading cause of cancer death in the United States by 2020. Moreover, an estimated 4,000 will die in California from pancreatic cancer in 2013. Because there are no currently, there are no early detection tools or curative treatments, just 6% of those diagnosed will survive more than five years. It is the only major cancer with a five-year relative survival rate in the single digits. 
So we would like to thank the City Council for your important contribution to this national fight against pancreatic cancer by declaring November 2013 to be Pancreatic Cancer Awareness Month. In San Jose, we are help, you are helping us to do the critical work of making the public aware of the disease and its truly lethal nature. We hope by working together, we will be able to continue to raise awareness, support patients and their families, and raise funds to find the cure. My colleagues and I are here today. We'd be happy to answer any questions you might have and encourage you to visit our website at www.pancan.org or call us. And we will be happy to help you learn more about pancreatic cancer, our organization, and its mission. Thank you for supporting our cause. Next item is the consent calendar. I want to pull item 2.5, the travel report. Any other items councilmembers want to pull for discussion? Motion is approved the balance of the consent calendar. On the motion, all in favor? Opposed? There have been opposed. Motion is approved. Item 2.5, uh, travel report. Uh, last week I traveled to New York City and Washington, D.C. to speak to uh, the Manhattan Institute in New York in a conference organized by the Pew Trust in Washington, D.C. I was speaking about uh, pension reform. Uh, they're very interested in what's going on in San Jose, and I'm very interested in finding some additional allies for our effort to get uh, the employee choice provisions of our pension reform ballot measure B to give our employees a choice in the opt-in program. And uh, so I spoke about that managed to get some interest from the New York Times as well as some of the uh, staff people of Manhattan Institute that are going to write about it. Uh, I also met with the U.S. Conference of Mayors staff around the next uh, Mayors Conference, which will be in January, and their efforts. They're part of our organized efforts uh, of national organizations working on uh, getting the IRS to issue private letter rulings to help facilitate employee choice and pension benefits. Uh, so successful trip. We'll see if New York Times writes a story that'll help uh, publicize what we're doing, put a little bit of pressure on the IRS to move this work higher up on their priority list. It's in their work plan, uh, but they haven't gotten around doing it yet. And obviously it's important of all of our employees to have a choice. And uh, so that was the reason for the trip. And that is it on my trip report. Anybody else with trip report? Okay, no action to be taken. It's just a report. We move now to item 3.1, report of the city manager. Thank you, Mayor. Members of the council, I have one topic today. This past Friday, the city of San Jose was one of the top sponsors for the 20th annual Santa Clara County Domestic Violence Conference. So thank you to the mayor and council for approving funds that contributed to this important conference in which experts shared best practices and emerging programs that address early intervention and prevention of domestic violence among children and youth. Council members Pete Constant and Don Rocha also contributed to the success of this conference, which had nearly 400 people in attendance. To give you an idea of just how much domestic violence impacts our community, here are just a few statistics. In 2011, there were 4,655 domestic violence related calls for assistance to our police departments in Santa Clara County. In a one-year period, emergency shelter and transitional housing were accessed by 755 victims and children. At the conference, a discussion about ways that local groups can take action 
grassroot, grassroots community building was a particular interest for our staff. In attendance were representatives from the city manager's office, including deputy city manager Norberto Duenas, staff from the Department of Parks, Recreation, and Neighborhood Services, and from the San Jose Police Department. I would also like to acknowledge the role of the county's commission on the status of women and the Domestic Violence Council for making this year's conference a reality through their efforts. In the near future, the Domestic Violence Intervention Resource Collaborative will host a series of community workshops across Santa Clara County on the issue of domestic violence, and we will keep the council informed as the dates and times are scheduled. And that concludes my report. Next item is 3.3, .3, amendment to the myers Nave agreement for legal services related to the fiscal reform plan. City Attorney. Uh, I'm really here to answer questions. The report's in your packet. We have a motion to approve the item. Uh, I'd like to note uh, that I did watch uh, the myers Nave law firm in action in the Measure B hearings that took place in in July, I thought they did an excellent job representing the interests of the city. Uh, there are $20 million in the budget in this year that is dependent upon uh, the defense in those cases and many millions of dollars more in future years that are dependent upon the defense in those cases. And we have to use outside counsel because all of our lawyers have a conflict of interest on that. So. Uh, while it is, uh, is certainly an expense and it's certainly a lot of money, it is a relatively small compared to the amount of money that's on the table in the litigation that we're defending. Uh, Councilmember Recalra. Thank you, Mayor. And I won't go into a, a long speech today. I think I've spoken enough about this issue. I'll just say based upon a different approach and philosophy in terms of a fiscal approach, political, strategic, uh, as well as um, the, the the, the fact that we're you know, continuing to give millions of dollars to an outside law firm to continue this course of action, I'll be voting no on this item. Councilor Rocha. Thank you, Mayor. A question for the city attorney. As far as the projected budget that we had on this originally and this last amendment, are we moving at a pace we expected or is the expenditure larger than we had originally planned? It's within the parameters. Uh, I think I initially estimated two to five million dollars. It really depends on, and this is getting through the uh, the entire process, the Court of Appeal. Uh, one of the difficulties with litigation is um, with uh, you lose some control over the cost in terms of this was a five-day trial. Uh, she called parties back for another day. Um, there's a lot of there was motions for summary adjudication. There were uh, pre-trial briefs, there were post-trial briefs, just a lot of lawyering. So to the extent that uh, this isn't surprising, uh, given the outside counsel fees, I will say this is, is one of the reasons, or the primary reason we do most litigation in-house, because the cost does get this high, but it is within the, uh, the parameters of what we anticipated. Thank you. That pretty much covers what I was looking for in terms of feedback. I, I guess I'm playing out if this is just the first round and the costs associated. Uh, I'm assuming, not been through this before, that we would continue with one law firm and not change firms um, in trying to get a, a better deal for our dollars, so to speak. Not that that's in my, my best interest is the best representation, but um, I just don't know how long this is gonna continue and no, I don't think anyone does as well. And as the costs keep climbing, is there another point where we do a check-in, so to speak, and talk about our representation up to a certain point? I, th I think you get to uh, each stage of um, litigation. There are, you know, sort of uh, cross that bridge when you get to it. Uh, depending on the trial judgment, uh, the trial court's decision, uh, I think you'll then decide or have be in a position to decide uh, whether what to continue and whether to continue with this firm. Um, you know, there are certain firms that do just appellate work, and but. That, We'll be bringing all that back to council. So in your mind, the, the place to have that discussion will be after the first round? Yeah. Okay. I mean, typically there's a good reason for continuity, but yes, like I say, I we'll cross so. that bridge when we get to it. Thank you. Councilman Ricardo. Thanks, Mayor. Um, Rick, typically uh, you expect that <coughs> in, with a path that involves what we all anticipate will be proceedings in the trial court and appellate 
and perhaps Supreme Court, um, that the bulk of the costs tend to be around evidentiary hearings and trials uh, at the front end, uh, and that uh, a typical appeal is not going to cost what a typical trial will. Is that, is that a fair It shouldn't. I mean, when you consider, and it, really to your point, the trial level, as you know, is, is labor intensive. You're, you're uh, talking to witnesses, you're interviewing people, there's a lot of research. There's a ton of documents that had to go, they had to get from the city, whether it was in the city clerk's office or from other departments. They went there, they had to get through and sift through a number of documents. Um, that's what's labor intensive. By the time you get to the appellate level, the research, 95% of it's done. Yeah. And it's really, you know, the arguments have been uh, said and a lot of it is just, you know, they may be refined, but m most of the work's been done. Okay, thank you, Rick, that's helpful. And then with regard to where the money's coming from, we appropriated $1.5 million in last year's budget as part of the reserve. Uh, for the implementation, is, is that right? And this comes from that pre-existing appropriation from that's last year. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Chu. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I will not be supporting the motion, and I want to thank the uh, city attorney and Meyer Snabe for doing a good job in defending our uh, city. Um, this is really a an, an very strong evidence that we're putting a so complicated issue to the voters and let the voter to decide uh, uh, such a complicated issue within uh, a few minutes. I don't know how many hours they, they will spend reading the, um, the, the ballot uh, document. So I think, to, I, I, I believe we would definitely have a way to uh, save the, the $20 million without going through this uh, uh, legal action. So I will not be supporting the motion. Councilor Constant. Thanks, I just want to say when we jumped into this, we knew that it was going to be an expensive and um, long road, but I don't know if we have the answer to this, but uh, perhaps the city manager might. As a percentage of our annual expenditure of pension contributions, which is, as we know, rising rapidly, and that's the reason we've been doing this, do you know what that percentage is? Where we're at right now? Yes, uh, having had to testify to that uh, number, um, we're at about 20%, I know, um, and the forecast is currently projecting up to 25%. Of course, those numbers can change, but that's the current uh, status. I, I actually meant the, the bill as a percentage of our pension contributions. I think it's less than 2%. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you meant the actual pension contributions. Because our, our contributions this year, I believe, were in the 260, 270 yeah, million range. Yeah, it's about 20% 20, 20 or so. Yeah, so. Well, you figure 2, per, uh, two million or so, uh, 2.7 million on a $800, $900 million general fund budget. It's right. a pretty small amount. Right. I think no matter how you look at it, whether it's a percentage of the budget, but more importantly, as a percentage of the problem we're trying to correct, it is uh, probably about 2% of the pension contributions. And as I said many times during the process going to this, I, I think we have a, a very strong obligation to our residents and voters, not only to resolve the issue at hand, but to fulfill the will of the voters as well. So um, I don't know if there's a motion on the floor, but if there's not, a motion to approve. There is a motion. Yeah, we have a motion on the floor. Councilmember Herrera. I'll be supporting the motion. I just want to say that <clears throat> I think the voters in San Jose uh, did understand the issues, and there was uh, a couple of years of informing them in, in various ways, um, including many, many meetings and uh, newspaper articles and all kinds of information put out to them. And, um, you know, I, I feel very gratified that the voters were able to understand the complex issue. And, and render a very decisive decision. And I think we need to hold faith with that and uh, move forward. And it's already been stated, the relative cost of this litigation, it's, it's already been budgeted for. Obviously, none of it, all of us would rather see us not spend it on this, but we budgeted for it, we anticipated it, and we need to see it through. City Manager. Yes, uh, let me just add my thoughts. Uh, as the only named party on the city side um, I was very appreciative of the support I received in preparing for trial, as were the other uh, city witnesses. And I think regardless of how we got here, um, it's very important that we have the best team available moving forward. 
I'd just like to add that the retirement costs of the city have gone from uh, 72 million to 271 million dollars per year over the last decade and they continue to go up and uh, spending money uh, to try to solve that problem is necessary and that's why I'm going to support the motion. On the motion, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Got one, two, three opposed. Uh, Cara, Campos, and Chu are opposed. Motion carries. Our next item is 4.1, rezoning of property at the southeast corner of South Bascom Avenue and Woodard Road. Move approval. We have a motion to approve. I have one request to speak, I believe. I didn't hear a second. Uh, Mr. Andari? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I wish to yield my uh, time to speak at this point. Okay. Thank well, you. I don't think there are any questions. We have a motion to approve. Right on the motion, all in favor? Opposed? None opposed, that's approved. Item 4.2 and 7.1 are gonna be heard jointly regarding the citywide capital improvement program annual status report and streamlining measures and the semi-annual regional wastewater facility capital improvement program report. Uh, a couple of really big ticket items here and there. Not as big as it used to be in past years, but still a significant capital improvement budget. So we will have a, a staff presentation on these two items. I'm assuming Dave Sykes will go first, but that's just a guess. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. David Sykes, Director of Public Works. I am joined by Ashwini Kantak, the Assistant Director of ESD. As you mentioned, we'll be doing two uh, relatively brief presentations, one on the citywide CIP and the other on the Regional Wastewater Facility semi-annual CIP. Um, as the Council has become familiar with this report, uh, it captures really the status of all active CIP projects in the city. Um, I will note that we've made the switch uh, to do this on a fiscal year basis. In the past, we've done this on an uh, annual year basis. It's also important to note that uh, the projects and the work reflected in this report um, represent all the activity by all the departments, virtually all the departments are involved with the delivery of capital projects in the city. Just to kind of give a, a snapshot of, of activity over the last fiscal year, uh, we uh, completed 101 projects valued at $110 million, and we awarded 60 projects uh, valued at $70 million. In, in the current fiscal year, we're projecting to award 85 projects from an increase from last year, and those 85 projects are estimated at a value over, of over $116 million. Uh, this report also provides not only uh, the status of each project in terms of schedule, but also budget information on each project. And as always, we are tracking our performance based on our delivery targets, and those are reported out in, uh, in the annual budget process in the uh, CIP part of that. Haven't shown this chart in a while, so I thought it'd be important to, to, to bring back. Um, it's kind of always interesting to see where the dollars go in terms of the delivery of a project. 30% uh, of the project budget, and this is of course a typical scenario, it, it does kind of deviate from project to, to project, but 30% of the budget goes to, to the city, what we typically refer to as soft costs. It could be city staff or design consultants, our construction management and inspection of the project, and of course the front end feasibility work. The other 70% basically goes to the contractor and subs. And you can see kind of the breakdown of, of where those dollars go, go. As you can see, most of the, the project costs are really driven by market conditions. Uh, the cost of material, the cost of labor, how competitive the market is, and certainly how effective the, the particular contractor that submits the lowest bid is. 
Um, so those are typical uh, costs for, for most of the projects, and those have remained pretty consistent throughout the years of, of our work in delivering projects. Um, these are the, the major drivers that uh, really uh, drive the, the capital program and the projects within it. I'm not going to go over them in great detail because I did go over these drivers quite a bit back in February when we did our last report. Uh, but it's important to note that uh, these, these are the, the factors that really drive our decision making in terms of the projects that, uh, that come from the capital uh, program. It's good to always to check in on the status of the bond programs. Uh, we had three, three bond programs, as the council knows. Uh, we've been extremely successful as a staff, and this organization should be very proud of the progress we've made. In the park program, we've completed 95 of the 97 projects, with just two remaining, the Coleman Soccer uh, Complex, which is underway right now, and then the softball complex, which the council will be hearing an update next week. In the library program, we've completed 19 of the 20 projects with just one remaining underway in the design process, and that's the Southeast Branch Library. And in the public safety program, we've completed 28 of the 30 projects with just two fire stations remaining, Fire Station 21 out near Lake Cunningham and then Fire Station 37, which is currently on hold. All in all, there were 30 buildings, new buildings, this is not counting uh, many remodels and renovations, 30 new buildings that we constructed uh, successfully with the program. We are kind of in a time of transitioning, transitioning from the big uh, kind of mega projects at the airport and the convention center, and now into work out at the regional wastewater facility, and Ashwinia will cover that in just a moment. Probably the, one of the biggest uh, challenges that we're facing in terms of CIP delivery is in essence an increase in workload. Yes, the CIP is, is, is down from what it was, but the number of projects, because we're doing more smaller projects, so the number of projects are going up. And of course, we're dealing with, uh, and this is pretty much universal in each of the departments, uh, high vacancy rates and a lot of turnover. So we do have a lot of staff uh, that are new in their position and, um, and are not as efficient as some of the more seasoned staff that we've had in the past. Just kind of going over a few strategies, so um, a renewed commitment to training and development of our staff and updating of our project management manuals is in our work plan for this year. Uh, continue our commitment to alternative project delivery. It's not just design build. Um, we've probably tripled the number of on-call contracts that we have available to us to help with the, the, the smaller type projects. And uh, kind of back to basics in some ways, doing more pre-qualification of of uh, contractors to ensure that we can weed out the, the bad actors. In terms of the bidding climate, that's also changed in the last few years. We've gone from a very, very competitive uh, uh, climate to one that's still competitive, but not as much as it once was. We're seeing our engineers, uh, the bids coming in around 5% below our engineers' estimates. When we were in the days of the super competitive market, we were seeing bids coming in 20% below our estimates. And we've gone from basically having 10 bids per project to an average of about four right now. Um, so still a competitive market, but not uh, the hyper -competi competitive market we once saw. Uh, we're also looking very closely at where our dollars go and how local, whether they stay local. 50% um, of the projects that we awarded went to local general contractors. But we are looking at that a little bit more closely because just because you award to a local general doesn't mean that they're using local su subs. And conversely, you can award a project to um, a general from another county and they could also use local subs. So we're looking at that a little closer to see what strategies we can use to, to keep as many of our dollars local as possible. Uh, we continue our commitment to uh, very detailed cost tracking and accounting. Um, and certainly our centralized procurement process and our QA, QA, uh, QA, QC process has resulted in a lot less protests. Um, certainly I think in the last couple of years the council may have only seen one where in previous years we were bringing quite a few forward to the council. So some of uh, the strategies that we've been using um, are paying off. Next I'm going to hand it over to Ash Winnie to give an update on the regional wastewater facility. Thanks Dave. Good afternoon Mayor and Council, Ashwini Kantak, Assistant Director of EFC. Um, so we're really happy to be here today to present to you what is our second 
second annual CIP report, semi-annual CIP report, and we'll have the presentation up in just a bit. So uh, this is a reporting period from January to June of 2013. And in this reporting period, we were actually able to advance many important projects and procurements. It was uh, a lot of activity in the past six months. And um, there, um, there were a total of 36 active projects in different project phases, as you can see up on the slide. Over a third of these projects are in the early conceptual planning um, or uh, project development stage and thus do not have uh, detailed schedules or budgets. The rest of them um, uh, do have established budgets and schedules. And key projects are actually highlighted um, on pages 22 through 27 of the uh, CIP report. So some of the major accomplishments in this reporting period included construction of five projects totaling nearly $12 million. These projects included reliability projects uh, such as a standby generator and switchgear replacements. Also included projects related to facility improvements uh, such as roof and handrail replacement as well as a fire main replacement. And then in addition to the completed projects, we also awarded six construction contracts and one service contract totaling more than $5 million. Again, uh, focus on reliability improvements such as the 115 KV circuit breaker proje uh, replacement project. We also um, are moving forward with automation improvements such, an up, such as an upgrade to our distributed control system and then other miscellaneous facility improvements such as street rehab and handrail replacement. We have made substantial design progress on some key projects. Those include the digester gas compressor upgrade. Uh, we're replacing a failed uh, digester gas holder, gas storage holder, and then also emergency diesel generators. We have started significant feasibility evaluations, uh, one on the cogeneration facility, a new cogeneration facility, and then one on the tertiary filters. Um, we have previously shared with you that we will need to use an integrated team approach to deliver a CIP of this magnitude. Um, so we will have city staff as well as consultants, and we've talked about that at great length with you. Uh, so in this past reporting period from January to June, we were able to bring on board an executive program advisor and a technical coordinator, and then significantly advanced procurements for program management services as well as design services for the digester rehab project. And council actually awarded um, those in uh, September and October, respectively. Um, the four, we, we also contracted with four consultants. We have several existing master agreements, and so we contracted with them to perform a variety of functions on key projects. So that includes an assessment of the existing headworks, um, a project definition report for the new cogeneration facility that I just talked about, uh, preliminary engineering for emergency generators and bid documents for the digester gas holder. So over the next six months, we expect significant activity on the wastewater CIP. The program management firm, which is now on board, will be setting up systems and processes to uh, support the efficient and effective delivery of the CIP. In collaboration with city staff, they will also embark on a project validation exercise, which will take a closer look at the 100 plus projects that have already been identified. They will also be identifying other missing projects as well as taking a look at any projects that need to be accelerated because of faster than anticipated deterioration. And so this validation process will really help inform the development of the next five year and 10 year CIP along with schedule and cost estimates. And uh, they will also be looking at efficiencies in terms of bundling the projects. Uh, so how can we most effectively deliver these projects, um, which are so many in number. In addition to progress at the programmatic level, several major projects will also be moving forward, including a project definition report for the cogen facility, designed for the digester and thickener facilities upgrade, and also a feasibility analysis on biosolids treatment and disposal options. So we look forward to reporting progress on these 
uh, through our next report. And then another significant milestone that I just wanted to touch upon was that the draft EIR for the plan master plan uh, was circulated for public review. We received over 300 comments from environmental groups and regulatory agencies. And so in the next six months, we anticipate, which is the period we're in now, we anticipate EIR certification as well as adoption of the master plan. It will actually be going to the Planning Commission on October 18th and then coming to Council uh, on November 19th. And that concludes uh, our presentation. We're available for questions. Thank you. Thank you. I was here at the beginning of the decade of investment and uh, got to spend uh, years watching the staff do great work with all of the uh, bond funded infrastructure projects, public safety, parks, libraries, community centers. And we established a really excellent record of on time and on budget, managing a lot of projects. So w while the number of projects is down and the total budget is down, we still are spending a lot of money on capital projects and staff uh, is still doing a, a great job of, of managing those projects, although we have a lot less staff than we had before and being on time and on budget is something that's really important. And the expertise that we developed during that decade of really big capital budgets uh, serves us well today. The budget is smaller, but it's still very big compared to uh, uh, lots of other cities. <coughs> so there's a lot of work to be done. And uh, I just want to compliment the staff on their very uh, excellent approach to handling big projects and bringing the expertise of public works together with uh, Environmental Services Department to handle the wastewater uh, facility uh, makeover, which is a really big project. I think is a, an excellent example of coordination among departments building on the expertise, the things that we learned in the convention center and the airport and others uh, to deliver a, a complicated project. Uh, while the facility is in motion, uh, just like the airport, you can't close it down. Uh, there might be a lot of uh, workarounds, but you still have to be open uh, 24 hours a day. So uh, it's not as maybe glamorous as the airport, but uh, the wastewater facility is a not allowed to fail, absolutely a critical piece of infrastructure. And so it, it's good to see that we've assembled a really good team uh, to do it using the, the best of our staff and the best of outside resources to, to bring to, together the work. And so I'm looking forward to seeing these progress reports periodically. I think it's a good tool for keeping the public informed of what we're doing uh, with a series <coughs> of, of complicated projects. Councilmember Liccardo. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks for the presentation, Ashwini and Dave. <clears throat> I had a question that maybe maybe Jim Morpal would be in the best position to respond to. Um, and actually, forgive me, I just realized we uh, we went back and forth between this general CIP and and this. Should we be focusing our questions only on stormwater and, and come back to the larger CIP report. Yeah, no, so we it doesn't really, we'll hold off. It doesn't really matter. It's up to, up to you, however you want to do okay, it. Okay, that's fine. It, it really relates to the larger CIP. And, okay, okay, if we can do that. If we need to go back to the other uh, slideshow, yeah. we could do that. But. Okay, great. Thanks, Jim, for being here. Sure. Just had a quick question about, <clears throat> in, in the CIP report, recognizing we've got ambitions to convert a lot of streetlights to LED, and I'm grateful for all DOT's doing. But we also know lots of neighborhoods, you know very well, are afflicted with copper wire theft and huge challenges. I know we got big backlogs. We have challenges with not having enough electricians to be able to get up and running. Um, and my question is, do we have mechanisms today that are making these relatively more secure as we're installing the LEDs? Is there anything we're doing that's making these less likely to be subject to repeated theft? Councilmember Liccardo, Jim Orpal, Assistant Director of Transportation. It's a very difficult issue. Street light wire theft has been plaguing us for a number of years. Um, when we're doing the retrofits, though, it's primarily just retrofitting the actual device itself. So it's not really affecting the wiring down where right. it gets stolen from out of the pull boxes out of the ground. <coughs> so from that standpoint, we really aren't uh, retrofitting the device itself. The new uh, LED street lights, though, do send a notification when power is interrupted or when the street light goes down so we get immediate notification and we're using that information 
coming into our systems to dispatch electricians or maintenance worker to see what's going on. Um, I'm happy to report that in the last couple of months, we've apprehended a, a couple of people in progress that the police department did, and, and I know that the CHP has been involved in that as well, so I think we're trying to step up our efforts in that way. In addition, whenever we do have tampering with any of our pull boxes or uh, stolen wire, when we're putting the pull boxes back in place, <laughs> we're using epoxy and affixing uh, our pull boxes to make them more secure. Uh, we're looking at a variety of different devices as well that will make it more difficult for uh, you know, criminals to, to essentially get at our wire, but it is a big issue. I think we're going to need to in the next year really look at all available efforts. I think we've been challenged by the lack of available enforcement resources in police, just right. the, the, the uh, issues associated with the priorities that they're dealing with. Uh, I know that Councilmember Camus has uh, brought forward ideas around um, uh, rewards for people who are reporting. We've notified our entire workforce and police and transportation to be on the lookout for it. So with the available resources we have today, we're doing, I think, everything we can. Uh, I think more can be done, but I think we need to look at where can we get the resources to do uh, more in the way of securing our system and uh, initiating enforcement around trying to stop the individuals. Okay, thank you for that, Jim, and I recognize it's, it's not an easy problem to deal with. Um, and I do recognize the LED is just the fixture, not the whole wiring, but I guess my sense was, hey, we're out there anyway. Is there something we can do while we're out there? And, and I, I guess as we're, you said we've got LED um, technology, or part of the technology is now alerting us to when someone is uh, tripping the system essentially to shut down power to that particular light? Is, is that, is the that what it is? The specific notification that we get is if the light has stopped functioning okay. or if power has been interrupted to the light itself. So, so that's an indication to us that either there's a, a, a malfunction, a, a uh, mechanical malfunction or some type of tampering. So is there anything that tells us that if there are multiple lights <laughs> being impacted, now we've really got a problem that police need to respond to, as opposed to just an electrician going out there to fix it? That's a great question. I would say yes. I, I think that is the case because each individual LED fixture that's installed uh, has that dynamic capability to note what's happening with that light. So yes, that would be an indication to us. Okay. So yes. So do, does our police know that, that there's a? I, I don't believe that that notification is going to the police department yet. I think we have to connect that more into the 911 um, system. So that's something we, we're coordinating with police, but that's probably something we can do more of in that regard. Okay, thank you. And, and as I look at the, the schedule changes, I know that we've, we're what, 2,700 lights in already. I know we've got some more to go. I'm looking at the schedule in figure 4-1 where we've got three conversion projects, all of which have some scope change and schedule resets. <coughs> um, and is that because <laughs> we've got more lights to go change out or what, what's sort of holding that up? Yeah, so, so all of them have been completed. So oh, at right. this point in time, all of them com were completed. This is reporting on schedules that were reset last fiscal year. Oh, so okay. it is reporting that all three of those projects have been completed as of September. Uh, I think you're, you're right on the money in terms of the number of lights. We're actually at about 3,000 lights retrofitted. Great. We have about another 500 in the pipeline. And then the mayor and council allocated funding over a two-year basis to install about another, another 1,700 lights. So we're doing the kind of the conceptual planning and programming for that now, and we'll probably be rolling out a couple of projects over the next two fiscal years as well. So, uh, you know, we'll be approaching when that funding is exhausted, almost uh, five, uh, 5,500 lights retrofitted almost. Great, thanks Jim. You're welcome. Customer Colro. Thank you, Mayor. And Jim, one last question. The, the funding to retrofit the lights, where is that? Is that coming strictly from our CIP funds? So, so all the funding to date, council member, that we've completed projects and those that are in the pipeline now have been grant funded. Got it. So that's, why, next, that's why I recall. The next round of 1,700 are CIP local funded. Now, given the fact that we 
have an anticipated cost savings over X number of years, you know you're going to save a certain amount of money. Is there any way or was any thought being given rather than using CIP funds to just do a loan with the payback from the savings we get from, so it's basically self-funding that we get from the electricity savings from the, from the switch out of the lights? So we've researched that extensively. Uh, and initially, as the technology was coming out, it was higher priced. It is coming down at a certain clip um, through the, the ESCO process, which Dave, I think, can go into more detail on. We're evaluating that as well to see what type of energy savings can be reinvested in retrofitting more of the system. So it's something that we're exploring in many different ways. Maybe I'll let Dave add any okay. detail that he has on Thank that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Council Member. Actually, what you describe is, in essence, what the ESCO is about. If you recall, we did get approval from the council to move forward with Chevron, mm -hmm. and we will be bringing forward the first package here in the next couple of months. Uh, and I haven't seen the details of it yet, but I assume it will include a, a streetlight LED conversion component. And, and that's the that's the Chevron Energy Solutions that's done the same work with the Oak Grove School District, Eastside Union, some of the school districts to get solar uh, at the schools. A similar type process. Yeah. Okay, yeah, because I think that's a great idea. I mean, it's definitely helped the schools put in infrastructure, they didn't have money up front <laughs> to, you know, to put in the infrastructure. And so they were able to do that. Now they'll get ongoing cost savings and they can pay back the infrastructure costs through the, the, the savings over the years. So uh, I'm glad you're looking into that. I know it's not as simple as just filling out a piece of paper. I know it takes a lot of work to, to work it out with either whether it's Chevron Energy Solutions or another option, but I appreciate the fact that you're looking into that. So thank you. Thanks. And just, in, uh, uh, just me an add on that, Jim? I did. Just, it's, it's kind of general on it, Council Member, really to, to the entire Council, that we will be issuing an information memorandum to the Council as we move into the end of daylight savings time, as we have longer nights. We typically get more reports for street lighted outages, people coming home from work see them in their neighborhoods and, and on the major streets. We always give the Council an annual report this time to let you know where we're at on repairing street lights, kind of what's happening on the wire theft issue, and, and just to give you a, a clear uh, status report on where we're at and what we're trying to do to try and keep the lights on and, and running as much as possible. So you can expect that probably in the early November time frame. And, and does the solar uh, lighting, is, it, is there enough energy created from a solar, from, from solar lights that it, you can either uh, not have any hard wire wiring or in the event that the, that the wires are stolen or broken, that they can still operate at least minimally? Yeah, good question. I think at this point in time, the size of the solar device just doesn't create enough wattage, particularly for our major streets. Our, our neighborhood lights run on a much lower wattage, but they're very energy efficient. They're very low cost lights in our neighborhoods, and the cost to retrofit versus the energy that we use to this point hasn't penciled out for us. But there's no LED, the, the LED lighting hardware that you're replacing, there, there's no hardware in which you're going to fix some solar panels. If, if it, you're saying they're so efficient that I imagine they don't need a very large solar panel, like I see some of the yeah. speed limit signs have it, and I know obviously it's a different thing, but um, is there, is there uh, infrastructure? I, I would imagine there are solar devices for it. I don't think we've found a design that really has, has met, I guess, our requirements at this point in time. Um, it's something that we'll continue to explore. Those are the types of things that I think uh, we're, we're regularly looking at to find what's the kind of the best design for our system. Yeah, hey, Jim, if I could just add yeah. in a little Dave Sykes here. Um, yeah, I don't think we necessarily have find that, found that solar solution for the street lights, but for, for park lighting, we are, uh, with our last few projects, putting in solar park lighting, and you're right. That means there, real, there are no wires under the ground to steal. Um, and so if that park lighting uh, exercise works, and maybe, we, maybe at some point we could bring that uh, to the street lighting, obviously, there have to be a, a solar array on every street sure. light, and so we'd have to kind of think about that. Yeah, I'm not suggesting we go down that road just yet, but I'm glad you're doing it and looking at it at least for the parks. Um, you know, parks, some, some of the lights uh, after dark are in some desolate areas, and so you might get, uh, you know, temptations for folks to steal copper wire as opposed to, to lights that are right on, this, on the street, so they're going to be seen, you know, and so just th it's logical that you would start in the parks because those, those lights also don't take as much energy to lower to the ground, uh, and so start there, use use that as your laboratory experiment and, and see then if we can expand it to other lights. But what, if, if there's an opportunity to remove the, cop, the need for copper wire altogether, I think that's a great end result if it's feasible and if it's sustainable. Uh, so thank you for that. And then uh, last couple of things on the water pollution control plant when I went out there and, and did a tour with Carrie and uh, the site manager, there's no doubt there's a lot of infrastructure needs. I'm glad that we're investing in it and looking into it. I mean, some of the 
uh, some of the parts of the facility are decades old. Uh, of particular note is the energy, uh, the, the backup generators. I think that if the if they fail, if they fail, it could be cat catastrophic. So uh, I'm glad we're looking into it. I think that uh, it, uh, it's it's a matter of safety, uh, and so I look forward to further updates on um, on how that project is going. And finally, I just want to thank you, uh, thank you and, and, and the entire team. I know it was a lot of folks that have been involved with the city staff on this entire CIP project. And so um, the, the majority of the projects are on time, uh, under budget. I think that the, the bittersweet silver lining of the, of the recession was that we were able to at least get uh, way below engineers' estimates. And even though it's creeping up, it looks like we're still getting some pretty good value. And so I commend you uh, for getting very competitive bids and for the most part, uh, bids that are, are, are executed uh, effectively and on time. So thank you. Councilmember Chu. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you both for the wonderful report and um, follow up on what Ash have touched a little bit regarding to the uh, solar powered uh, street light. You know, I remember that we first, uh, we installed the first 20 of those uh, LED street light as a pilot program when we still have an RDA probably five, six years ago in, in North San Jose uh, around Cisco. And over the past five, six years, um, I have seen the uh, solar powered street lights in the cities in, in, in China and, and, and Taiwan. So I, I uh, uh, again will encourage our staff to revisit those uh, technologies. I mean, if they can do it, I don't um, know why can't we do it. That would really e eliminate the copper theft pr problem that uh, Council Member Licardo is trying to address. So, so I would really encourage you to, you, to uh, continue revisit the technology and see w w what are they using, and why can't we incorporate it uh, here. And, and also, um, I'm really, really happy to hear uh, David's uh, presentation regarding to the local hired. Not only we're paying attention to the general contractor, we're actually delivered down to the, to the subcontractor's uh, uh, level. So I, I wonder, in, in this uh, uh, regional water, uh, wastewater facility, uh, um, are we also paying attention to the local hired uh, with the local uh, workforce? Uh, yes, we are. Um, certainly, we will be tracking the, the wastewater projects as we do with the other CIP projects at the level of the general contractor. It does take more work for us to kind of go in and look at what the subs are doing and where they're getting their workforce. So we're going to be looking at uh, a sampling of projects throughout the program to kind of draw conclusions from, from that sample rather than try and do that work effort on every single project. Great. I, I know they create more work, but I think uh, it also yield a, a very good return for, for, for the resident here and also for our local economy. So yep. thank you very much for continue uh, uh, looking into that. Thanks. Councilmember Ferreira. Yeah, just a quick question for Jim Ortball back on the LED. I just was curious whether <coughs> these uh, sensors that are indicating the, the power interruption, is that going to be rolled up into the dashboard that transportation's uh, going to be implementing? that new dashboard. We'll be able to look and see. In um, terms of dashboard, help me out a little bit. We've got, not we, we just had a presentation from, from Hans about some, some software and a, the ability to look at traffic signal lights and, and get information and oh, have a okay, dashboard. Yes. The police okay, department's going to have a seat right, at the, the table. The transportation management center. Yeah, I'm forgetting yes, the name of it, but it's a dashboard basically. Will, thank, thank you for that. Yes, we will get that information into our transportation management center. So that it will come back into that location. So we will be able to see uh, if street lights are malfunctioning, if there's been powder in, interrupted, and that <coughs> that. And will currently, come back. that doesn't exist right now. So when this gets implemented, you'll actually be able to have a visual of where they are and where, where they are. What type of visual display? You know, we'll see that as the design comes out. I'm not sure the specific details of that. Um, right now, it comes into um, our staff uh, here at City Hall. Um, that will be in a, in a location that's staffed essentially 16 hours a day. When we move to the Transportation Management Center, we'll be staffing it from 7 in the morning typically till 11 at night. So it'll have 
much greater coverage, mm -hmm. more staff kind of focusing on that issue. So I think that will be a value. Yeah. Um, and we'll obviously have that center open for our partners as well, CHP, police department, you know, if they're able to staff that as well. And this may not be practical, but, um, you know, there could be some kind of alerting function that would signal, you know, much like when people report graffiti, they have somebody go out and report it, report back and resolve it. There could be some process put into place where there could be alerting and, and action taken on these on the light outages as well. In terms um, of like a, a mobile app reporting yeah, and some, repair, some kind of Absolutely. a way to do that that tie into the system and yeah, and maybe even you know, and everybody struggles with how to solve the copper wire theft. And I love the idea of solar. That would be great if we can just move beyond it and don't have copper wire, or we could come up with a different type of wire so that it wasn't so, uh, you know, such a, in such demand for, from everybody. But um, when we switched from the overhead to putting the wires in the underground, the areas where we have overhead wires, the older technology, we're not getting hit in those neighbors exactly. as much. Well, it, but I don't think we want to go it's, back. It's and obvious you can't get up and people would see you and that type of thing. I don't but think we want to go back to that though. But yeah. uh, if there could be even a buzzer, a noise, something that would scare people off. I mean, that's what home alarms are all about and making noise that, that would maybe stop somebody. I don't know if that's even practical, but it's just um, since we have the ability to, to know when the power is interrupted, if there's any way to. Yeah. I believe we're getting to the point that, that we are going to have to bring forward some more significant recommendations to deal with this just continuous issue of wire theft. It, yeah. it's, it's been plaguing us. <coughs> uh, we were hoping with the economy improving we'd see it decline, and, and that's just not happening. So I think we, we are going to have to need to look at a series of other measures. We've done what we can with the resources we've had. But given that we aren't seeing an interruption in the incidents and the amount of it happening, I think we are going to have to come forward with more uh, significant recommendations and the resources to be able to, to arrest this problem and, and to get going back in the other direction. <laughs> Literally arrest the problem. Literally. So, so, so the folks that you did arrest, was that around LED lights? I don't know which specifically was it was able. around in terms of the street lights. I also do know that one of our... Um, storm water pump stations was hit as well. So there's you know, significant wiring in those facilities. That one we did catch, and that was, I heard that just uh, this morning as well. I'm just wondering if, if the LED lighting and knowing that the power's interrupted enabled you guys yeah. to catch whoever was yeah. doing it or enabled the police department, if that helped. Because I would yeah. think at least the LED lighting is giving us some visibility into when power's interrupted. So yeah. it's a good thing as we, it's another benefit to moving toward the LED lighting, I think. I'll, I'll, ch I'll check in on that detail. I think that is an important detail that you raise. And just <laughs> and just in terms of uh, all the work in the CIP and, and water treatment going forward, just a, a big thank you to Dave Sykes and to Ashwini and your whole team. And you've done some really great work citywide. And I just want to say in our dis in District 8, we're really appreciative of everything you've done. and. Even the, the fire station with all its attendant issues, you got it done. And people are very happy that it's open. And everywhere you've been involved, you've added value. So we're, we're very appreciative. I just want to say that on behalf of the residents who don't all get to tell you that, thank you for that work. People do appreciate it. Councilor Licardo. I was just going to offer, I know we're getting far afield here, but just, Jim, when you guys do come back with other ideas, and uh, you don't have to respond because I know it's, I don't want to get too far off the subject, but um, I, I know, for instance, we have regional task forces on auto theft and other regional task forces. And I'm wondering if there is any option opportunity for regional cooperation around enforcement of licensing of brokers of the copper, that is making sure that anybody who's buying or selling <laughs> is actually permitted by a city or a county. And um, so that way we can require them to put, you know, have very basic, um, for instance, only accepting um, payment with verification and ident identity and, you know, perhaps money doesn't get transferred for a couple days, things like that, so that we can really get at the heart of where a lot of this copper is going, which is ultimately to brokers and making money. Thanks. Councilman Ferrer. I'm sorry, Sam made me think of one more thing. <laughs> Is there, and this probably may be impossible. Is there any way to, you know, sort of when, when people launder money and when big amounts of money are stolen, they can mark the bills so you can find them. Is the <laughs> copper, is there any simple way to have a fingerprint on the copper that s such that if it turned up in a place to be sold, once those regulations get in place, we'd be able to identify it as our copper? Previously, what we had did, the, the coating or the casing on the copper wire itself, we had logoed it or identified it as City of San Jose. 
what's happened is they strip it off. Um, so that was something that we were using when we had this kind of rash and epidemic about a decade ago and it was getting stripped off and so that additional cost proved to, to not be um, ultimately effective. I think, I think the uh, individuals involved in this caught up with that uh, and uh, it proved to, to not be effective over time. Well, I think we'd have to work with the police department, others who are, you know, there's yeah. probably other ways to identify it without letting the folks that are stealing it know it's identified. I, I think here's, a, I think all these ideas are worth exploring. I think what we need to do is find the resources to put into developing uh, the enforcement and the investigation work into these types of things. I think all the different ideas, you know, probably have some level of merit and we need to zero in on what are the ones that we think will be most effective in advancing. So I, I, I think we're taking in all these ideas and we'll be working with the police department and trying to find the resources to enable them as long as well as us and maybe others regionally to, to try and, uh, you know, really mitigate this issue. Absolutely the last thing. Um, Back to the manufacturer who make copper wire. I mean, I don't know where we end up in the chain of buying this stuff, but I, but the other thing is go back to the manufacturer. I'm sure if this problem is a problem across the country, the manufacturer could find a way to sell us copper wire that is ID'd for us so that we could be able to track it. I think that concludes the discussion. I think we need a motion to accept both reports. We have a motion to accept both reports. Councilman Oliverio. Thank you, Mayor Reed. I just wanted to make sure that the uh, CIP reflects that the Del Monte Park will be uh, not 2015, but more in the line of September 2014. If I can just get a verbal, I see a nod. So That's correct. Can, thank you for the verbal response. And then finally, uh, on this whole topic that we're discussing, uh, obviously, there was a law before the governor that would have allowed uh, much more uh, stringency in uh, the copper wire transactions, but that was vetoed. And I, I guess the only question is, even if we caught these individuals, like you mentioned, Jim, I really don't know what the penalty is when they get to the court system, because it might be viewed as not that significant based on uh, prison populations and stuff. So I think that's something we also have to acknowledge, but uh, thank you. We have a motion on the floor to approve both reports. On that motion, all in favor? Opposed? None opposed? Motion carries. Both reports are approved. Thank you very much, staff. Our next item is 8.1, a response to Santa Clara County Civil Grand Jury Report, Law Enforcement Public Complaint Procedures. Staff uh, from PD, Lieutenant Mata is here, but we have no report. Uh, he will answer any questions you might have. We have a motion to approve the staff response to the grand jury. We have no request to speak, I presume. Okay, on the motion, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? None opposed, that's approved. Last item is open forum. We have no request to speak on open forum, so we are done, we're adjourned.